in the previous segments we quickly set the stage for why we would consider phylogeny when we are comparing species and how we think uh, we might be able to model how continuous value traits evolve and we looked at a simulation where we saw that of course uh, this process of Brownian motion is kind of unrealistic because there's uh, other things happening as well uh, and we uh, learned a bit about the mechanics of uh, using independent contrasts for comparing sets of species taking phylogeny into consideration uh, in this lecture we're going to work through an example and uh, this example is also something that you can follow along with so the url that's shown here uh, has a links to an uh, r markdown document with basically the same steps as shown here on the slides but then in r code and if you feel brave you can uh, follow along um, but we are now not actually at this stage in the course where uh, I would expect you to be able to follow along. I mean, the uh, general assumption is that you have all taken a, a course in advanced statistics, and that then uh, also presupposes that you've had some R training and that you're comfortable working in R. But we might not all be at the same level, so later on in the course we will do some remedial teaching to get everybody at the same level, and maybe right now what's in this R Markdown document is a little bit advanced. Um, so following along right now is basically optional, but obviously recommended if you feel like it. So what are we looking at? Well, we're looking at uh, some diversity among the ungulates. Now, ungulates is kind of a folk taxonomic term what we're just meaning what we're talking about is are hoofed animals and actually they uh, uh, occur in two sister clades perisodactyla sitartiodactyla depends a little which phylogeny which taxonomy you follow um, but then if we follow this taxonomy then we come to find out that uh, among these sitartiodactyla are also the whales well, we are now disregarding those, so we're looking at kind of a paraphyletic group, but still they kind of cluster together in a phylogeny, which we'll be able to use. And seeing that they are mammals, uh, we have a ready source of interesting functional traits, namely those in the Pantheria database. So this is a basically a data set that was uh, published in 2009, um, and this contains a whole bunch of different uh, traits. You, you can imagine this as basically like a very large spreadsheet where every row is a mammal species and every column is a trait. And some of these traits are continuous valued and some of them are categorical. For now, we'll just look at the uh, continuous valued uh, traits. And uh, well, let's do a little bit of independent contrasts on those traits. Within the Pantheria database, there's uh, two columns that take the that present the midpoints of the ranges of mammals, and so therefore also of ungulates, in terms of their latitude and their longitude. And uh, so latitude is basically uh, along the north-south axis. So how far are you away from the equator? Uh, longitude is uh, east-west direction, right? And we can uh, therefore plot these uh, on a world map and then it kind of broadly uh, makes sense. Uh, so we see um, dots very far north, so these are going to be reindeer and caribou. Um, but we see mostly uh, dots uh, closer to the equator. So here, imagine things such as gazelles and zebras and so on. Uh, there's going to be a couple of points that fall in the water, but that's just because they are midpoints and they might span multiple areas, right? Um, but for the most part, they just fall where intuitively it makes sense. 
Now we are going to use these kinds of uh, continuous valued uh, variables uh, within the context of phylogenetic comparative methods. So we also are going to need a tree. And for that tree, we are just going to use one that's already been published, namely uh, this tree. So this is from a paper that presented a uh, super tree for the mammals as a whole. Uh, and so that has then been uh, pruned down to just the species that we're interested in. And here we uh, again do a visualization in R. In this case, we are plotting the tree with a uh, bar showing the geologic eras. So here we can see that uh, as is the case for most mammals, much of the diversification has taken place after the KT boundary or you know, after when the big rock fell from the sky, uh, killing the dinosaurs. Uh, so here's our tree and we had some traits. Uh, and one thing that we could do is just very qualitatively have a quick look to see uh, how such traits map onto the tree and that maybe gives us some sense of the amount of uh, phylogenetic structure there is in our traits. So here's an uh, example, it's the same tree, but now the branches are uh, colored using uh, actually the, the area the in square kilometers, kilometer squared for that each species uh, uh, occupies. So this is because this is a uh, surface area here. Uh, I have it log transformed. And so then there's some species that uh, have a high value or low value and it's color coded. You can see it's kind of like a heat map shown at the bottom. And uh, what we're supposed to uh, take home from this is that closely related species resemble each other in this range size. Uh, right, you see clades that are kind of blue, clades that are kind of green, a uh, couple of red ones. Uh, and so this should get the alarm bells ringing. We mustn't be naive and pretend that these are all independent values. Obviously, uh, these uh, species are not totally independent from another. Their range sizes resemble each other when they are closely related. So we can do something really bad and uh, just disregard all of that and just uh, do the thing that I already told you is wrong, which is just to plot these values in a scatter plot and uh, do some kind of uh, regression on that. So here, what we are looking at is on the x-axis, the uh, absolute latitude. So, uh, if you don't make this absolute, then of course these values can range from minus 90 to uh, 90, but I guess we can all flip them to the same hemisphere, and then it becomes a comparable uh, measure for a distance from the equator. So that's the x-axis. So now these are just values between 0 and 90. Um, and then obviously truncate a little bit because there's no ungulates that live directly on the North Pole or the South Pole. And then the uh, y-axis is again that area. And so the wrong thing we've done here is to just uh, treat those as if they are independent values. And uh, now there doesn't appear to be a very strong correlation here. So that maybe that's just uh, protecting ourselves from ourselves but because we're not rushing to publish this right away. But anyway, we, we shouldn't have done this anyway, right? Uh, I instead, we might take the phylogenetic independent contrasts. And so then if we're trying to do a slightly better job, then we do something like shown that's shown here. So we went over what the mechanics are, what the algorithm is for computing these independent contrasts. And we did a very small example with just four taxa. Now you can imagine that uh, when we're looking at hundreds of taxa, that gets a bit too tedious to do it by hand. Uh, so obviously there's uh, functions that do that for us, such as this uh, pick 
uh, function that uh, computes the phylogenetic independent contrasts. And then when we have these both for the absolute latitude and for the uh, log area, then we can do our regression like this. So here now, although those the absolute latitude is was well absolute, so always positive values. Remember that we are subtracting one from the other in a predictable pattern, and sometimes we might subtract a larger value from a smaller one. So the contrast can be negative, and same for the area. So that basically means like a, a shrinking of an area uh, and a uh, decrease in the latitude compared to the uh, ancestor. Uh, and then when we do the regression and we force that through the origin, well, it looks like maybe there is a positive correlation here. So that's kind of neat. Now, uh, is that actually significant? Well, then, uh, we uh, might do something such as uh, a linear model, just a regression in this case, where we uh, force through the uh, origin. And uh, then when we look at our uh, p-value, so that's uh, the uh, number next to the three stars. So this is highly, highly significant. Turns out there is indeed a, a positive correlation between range size and uh, distance from the equator. And then, of course, uh, the uh, exciting question is, well, do we, does this actually make sense? Do we know anything about biology that, uh, that this pattern fits into? And uh, sure enough, we do. Uh, so there's a bunch of these uh, eco-geographical rules. For example, there's uh, also this rule where... Uh, you know, uh, as you move further away from the equator, animals get uh, bigger, but then with relatively smaller extremities, so that, you know, polar bears and grizzlies are bigger than uh, bears that are closer to the equator. So that's Bergman's rule. Um, but there's also uh, here Rappaport's rule, which states that these ranges also get bigger at higher latitudes or smaller at lower latitudes. And it would seem that maybe we've uh, stumbled across one instance of that uh, general rule. Of course, this has been studied in different groups of organisms, and sometimes it holds up, other times it doesn't. But it looks like it might uh, be the case here. So, an uh, uh, actual application of phylogenetic independent contrasts, so that we can actually compare our ungulates uh, across all sets of related species. Thank you for listening.